America at war. The battle for Baghdad is coming apparently soon. U.S. forces moving toward the capital face sneak attacks and surprising sights along the way. Hanging tough, but talking of a possible longer war, allies Bush and Blair vow to win. The war comes to an early end for U.S. soldiers wounded in action, speaking out now about shocking scenes. And a family bears more than its share of the pain of war. The family that is the United States Marine. This is the CBS Evening News with Dan Rabin. Tonight, continuing coverage of America at War. Good evening. The war is broadening and lengthening. With sandstorm skies in Iraq clearing, the pace of the war is quickening, and the battle for Baghdad may be on in a matter of days. Here are some of the late developments. U.S. and British planes struck targets in and around Baghdad, the heaviest bombing raids in at least several days. In south-central Iraq, U.S. Marines fought and secured a strategic airfield near Nazaria. U.S. Army paratroopers dug in at an airstrip in Kurdish-controlled northern Iraq. President Bush and British Prime Minister Tony Blair vowed to see the war through to victory, however long that may take. Blair accused Iraq of executing captured British troops, a charge Iraq denies. We have CBS News correspondents deployed on the front lines with U.S. and allied forces and at other key locations around the world to bring you comprehensive coverage of the war. We start tonight with one of our correspondents in the desert, Jim Axelrod, who shows you how intense and how unexpected some of the fighting has been. He is in Kefal, only 75 miles south of Baghdad. It's been a deadly three days for Iraqis in Kefal, a small town on the east bank of the Euphrates River. After two nights of fighting with no victory, the Americans used the cover of the sandstorm to sneak in more troops. When the Shamal lifted this morning, uh, the enemy realized that you know we were right in the middle of it. And since this morning, Iraqi soldiers, Republican Guard, and militia have felt the full range of American power. From troops on the ground to a bomb dropped from 40,000 feet. The Iraqis are outmanned and outmatched, but fighting fiercely. Well, you saw that town, obviously. Uh, that was a little piece of Somalia there, you know, the things you see in the movies. Kefal is now a ghost town, silent, except for the bursts of gunfire and occasional sound of a rooster crowing. On the streets are a few dozen bodies. And in one store, the kind of bizarre, incongruous image you have to see to believe. It's inside Adam's Barber Shop, an image of the Twin Towers. But it's not a trophy painting of the destroyed towers. It's more like some glorification of them. It's certainly bizarre. That's the only word that can come up. But that's not the only challenge to logic in Kefal. Iraqis are taking on American troops, sometimes armed with nothing more than a flintlock rifle. They take on tanks with their sedans. If you want to ask any one of my soldiers out here right now what the key question is going through my task force is, the question is, why are they doing this? I don't know. I don't have the answer. The U.S. now has hundreds of prisoners here. Some have followed the instructions broadcast on loudspeakers. Surrender, surrender, surrender. Others, like this prisoner, have been shot and captured. But the critical importance of the battle for Kefal is that the U.S. Army has now crossed the Euphrates and held a town, something that must be done to get to Baghdad. Jim Axelrod, CBS News, Kefal, Iraq. The U.S. Defense Department emphasized again today that it is sticking to its original plan in Iraq and that it is still on schedule despite any perceptions to the contrary, despite sandstorms and Iraqi resistance. With another 50,000 troops ordered to Iraq, for U.S. forces already there, it is next stop Baghdad. Again tonight, we go to CBS's David Martin at the Pentagon for the big picture. David? Dan, there are now 90,000 U.S. and British troops inside Iraq, and the Iraqi defense minister himself says he expects Baghdad to be encircled in five to 10 days. But then he says house-to-house -house fighting could last for months. It's going to take more than this to bring down the regime of Saddam Hussein. And it's going to take more than this. Another series of explosions today in Baghdad. 
It's going to take hard fighting against the Iraqi fighters who make up for what they lack in firepower. Miller, you better have ammo ready. With ruthless tactics. So we can see them shooting, and then we'll see them march women right out in front, right across, right across our direction of fire. The Iraqis are fighting a delaying action, trying to make the American advance as costly as possible. It's not a strategy for winning, but it has exacted a price. Incredibly, no one was killed when the ammunition inside this American howitzer blew up after a misfire. That's nothing compared to Iraqi losses. The British report destroying 34 Iraqi tanks around Basra. But it's a fight the Americans hadn't expected. They've had to pull 2,000 Marines from duty off the Horn of Africa to help protect the endless streams of military hardware being rushed to the front lines where the battle for Baghdad will be fought. It will require the coalition forces moving through some Republican Guard units and destroying them or capturing them um, before you'll see the crumbling of the regime. Near Karbala, the 3rd Infantry Division is already firing its surface-to-surface -surface missiles at the Republican Guard Division, blocking its route to Baghdad. There are five Republican Guard Divisions around Baghdad and Saddam's hometown of Tikrit, and three of them are now under constant air bombardment which could be a sign of where the main ground attack will come, although Karbala is a holy city which U.S. forces hope to avoid. Before the battle for Baghdad begins, the U.S. plans to use airstrikes and helicopter gunships to destroy as many of the Republican Guard's missile and artillery as possible, since those are the weapons which could fire chemical shells. Dan? David Martin, live at the Pentagon with the big picture. Now we want to take a moment again to show you the scene in Baghdad tonight on this ninth night of the war. U.S. forces have stepped up the bombing as the Battle of Baghdad grows closer. Two-time Pulitzer-winning New York Times correspondent John Burns is there, and I asked him a short while ago about the Iraqi defense minister's comments that U.S. forces will soon have Baghdad surrounded. He talks like a military man. Basically what he told us was, we know they're coming. We've been ready for this for months. Let them come. They've got to come out of the desert sooner or later. Uh, and we've already given them a taste of what lies ahead. Uh, he talked about uh, learning a lesson when they arrive at Baghdad that they will never forget. He spoke about street fighting in Baghdad. Um, and basically he said what you've seen so far, the casualties you've seen so far, are nothing as to what lies ahead. He talked about a, a siege of two months. And he spoke about the lessons inflicted on American and British forces in that time, causing them to pay so heavy a price that they will not persist. John Burns of the New York Times. Some of those Iraqi tactics have made things especially tough for U.S. Marines trying to decide who is an enemy, who's a civilian, who is friendly on Iraq's roads. The first Marine expeditionary forces in central Iraq, north of Nasiriya, between the Tigris and Euphrates River, driving toward Baghdad. CBS's John Roberts reports it's rough and bloody going. U.S. Marines give medical aid to a group of Shiite Iraqis after their minivan is shot up, traveling along one of the main roads north of an Nazaria. The vehicle was riddled with small arms fire. The driver shot dead. No one is sure if it was U.S. guns or the Iraqi military shooting its own citizens. But this young boy pleads with this Marine, don't throw anything at us again. It's just a cut. It's just no, a cut. I would not leave it. No, I would not. American commanders are becoming increasingly concerned about civilian casualties in this war. I think they're what they're doing is killing their own people and trying to blame a lot of it on the U.S. and, and the British. Marines, already exhausted from three days of running battles with Iraqi forces, got into it again yesterday. These engagements have been enough to convince any Marine of the multiple dangers of war knowing that the real battles lie just ahead. John Roberts, CBS News, north of al Nazaria. Also near al Nazaria today, Marines battled and reopened Iraq's second largest airfield and unofficially renamed it Bush International Airport. The first plane to land on the newly cleared runway was a C-130 transport delivering supplies. And at Fort Hood, Texas, the first of some 12,500 troops of the Army's 4th Infantry Division got an official send-off. The 4th is the Army's heaviest armored division. Its tanks, artillery, helicopters, and other equipment are on ships now headed for the Persian Gulf. 
The nation's commander-in-chief has been holding a war summit at Camp David with British Prime Minister Tony Blair. And today, they met briefly with reporters. CBS News White House correspondent Bill Plant has that story. Bill, good evening. Dan, good evening. The president and the prime minister faced skeptical questions about the duration of this war and the breadth of its support. But they came back with a staunch defense of the way their campaign has gone thus far. Slowly but surely, the grip of terror around the throats of the Iraqi people is being loosened. In the wake of reports that the military now believes the war in Iraq will take far longer and require more troops than first thought, the president was asked how long he thought the conflict might last. However long it takes to achieve our objective. It's a matter of victory. And the Iraqi people have got to know that, see? They got to know that they will be liberated and Saddam Hussein will be removed no matter how long it takes. Both men accused the Iraqi government of brutality to allied prisoners. An emotional Blair spoke of this video of what he said were British soldiers executed by the Iraqis, a charge Iraq denies. If anyone needed any further evidence of the depravity of Saddam's regime, this atrocity provides it. Challenge to explain why traditional allies such as France and Germany do not support the war, Blair acknowledged divisions over the conflict, but said he and the president believed they had to act. I have no doubt that we're doing the right thing. I have no doubt that our cause is just, and I have no doubt that were we to walk away from this conflict at this time, we would be doing a huge disservice to future generations. Blair left here for New York to meet with the U.N. Secretary General to talk about a plan to free up money from Iraq's oil sales for food. And tonight, it appears there is agreement in the Security Council on restarting the oil for food program. Dan? Bill Plant reporting live from the White House. A civilian who behind the scenes was a principal architect of the war with Iraq, Richard Pearl, resigned today as chairman of the influential Pentagon Policy Board that advises Defense Secretary Rumsfeld. No reason was given, but there have been questions of conflict of interest growing because Pearl is also an advisor to businesses with multinational interests. One of the early successes of this war was the capture of Iraq's southern oil fields in a rapid action that limited destruction to only a few wells. But CBS's Lee Cowan reports from the Ramallah oil field, U.S. forces have discovered more threats there than burning oil. They're calling it Hades on the Euphrates. 3,000 degree infernos ignited by retreating Iraqi troops. But CBS News has now been told they may have left behind even more. The Iraqi soldiers recently emplaced um, anti-personnel and anti-tank mines in and around parts of the oil fields and the oil wells. Is this pretty typical, this fire? Pretty much. So if capping these fires wasn't hard enough, my biggest challenge has been getting water. Now U.S. Marines have to comb an area roughly the size of Delaware to see what else the Iraqis have in store. It is a very uh, dangerous mission. Securing Iraq's oil fields had always been a top priority for the U.S. and for good reason. Had more of Iraq's oil resources gone up in flames, so too would the cost to rebuild. If they're lucky, the oil fires here may be out by the end of the week. But Saddam Hussein's handiwork may remain in these fields for months. Lee Cowan, CBS News at the Ramallah oil fields in southern Iraq. Coming up next on the CBS Evening News, Voices of the Wounded. For the first time, some of those who now wear the red badge of courage describe the pain and the shock of what they faced. More bodies of Americans killed in the war have come home. The remains flown today to Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. All told, the Pentagon now officially reports at least 25 Americans killed in action. At least 40 others are listed as wounded. Seven Americans are known to be POWs in Iraq. At least 10 Americans are confirmed missing. Figures on Iraqi dead, wounded, and missing, military and civilian, are unknown but widely believed to be in the thousands. Some of the Americans wounded in the war are now being treated at hospitals in Germany, and they are telling how they got their battle scars. In some cases, they didn't think they'd live to tell their tales. CBS's Lara Logan is in Germany and has their stories of fear, pain, and bravery. For these soldiers, the war is over, but it could have ended very differently. 
I saw the missile coming at us, and you know I could hear it and everything. So it makes like this pinwheel sort of noise, and I was just looking at it, and it was just like slow motion almost. That's when it clicked in my mind that oh my god, you know we're we're definitely in it now. I realized it too late. You know, I was too worried about shooting a civilian that now I've, like, endangered the crew. I'm going to die because of it. Horgan survived the hit, but his leg was blown open. His close friend, Jamie Villafane, almost lost his arm, but kept firing. When I turned, I, you know, I heard the noise again, and I turned, and there was another RPG coming at me from uh, the same direction that the first one did. Villafane described the moment he captured the first of four armed Iraqi soldiers wearing uniforms under their civilian clothes. I was so aggravated. I mean, I really, deep inside, I, I think I really wanted to just, you know, strangle him for doing that, you know, shoot him right there for doing it. But I mean, we, that's not what we do. If I had a gun, I would have shot them because I was so furious that they thought that they could, they could shoot at us and then when things weren't going their way, they could surrender and take advantage of how we were going to take care of them. For Villafane, this is the end of military life. Time now to be with his wife and children. Sergeant Hogan says the experience hasn't diminished the love he feels for his country. You know, I think the United States is a, uh, is a country that's always, that's always willing to change for the better. And that, that goes for a lot, like in my book, you know. And that, that I think is worth, worth dying for. Laura Logan, CBS News, Landstuhl, Germany. Still ahead on the CBS Evening News, the mystery virus from Asia triggers a first-of-a-kind quarantine in North America, affecting thousands of people. North America now has new reason to be concerned about the mystery virus that has killed at least 54 people, mostly in China. World disease experts have just imposed health screenings on some international flights and other precautions include a first-of-a-kind quarantine just north of the border in Canada. CBS's Elizabeth Caledon is on the Health Watch. The vast majority of infections and deaths from the strange new virus known as SARS remain concentrated in Asia. Entire classrooms of children in Hong Kong are now forced to wear protective masks. But the speed with which SARS can travel is making some health officials closer to home anxious. We can't say that it's under control. In an unprecedented move, officials in Toronto have imposed a quarantine of thousands of people exposed to the virus. Anyone who has even set foot in this Toronto hospital where the first cases were seen in North America is being ordered to stay away from other people. Once it gets started, it's very hard to stop. It's like a, a brush fire that's throwing off sparks. Canada has now seen 62 probable cases and several deaths. The United States, 51 and no deaths. Disease experts from the CDC say a quarantine won't be necessary here. I can't emphasize too much the importance of applying appropriate infection control precautions to limit the spread of this syndrome. Disease experts are still racing to pinpoint exactly what this virus is. Knowing for sure will mean a breakthrough in treating it and preventing its spread. Elizabeth Caledon, CBS News, New York. Next year on the CBS Evening News, the misfortunes of war, anxious days, and sometimes painful news. How the families handle it. And I Across America, countless anxious families are following events in Iraq, hoping, praying for their sons and daughters, husbands and wives, mothers and fathers in uniform. CBS's Bobby Harley reports Nowhere is that anxiety more intense than at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, home base for at least 11 Marines killed in action this week and 11 more missing. In this Marine community, loss marches alongside love. Shelly Bacorny loved her husband. She says they were so close they could tell what the other was feeling. When they last looked at each other two months ago as he shipped out, the feeling was not good. When he left, I knew he wasn't coming home. That's how close we were. <laughs> he didn't have to tell me. She did so lose him, and two-year-old Taylor lost her father, Second Lieutenant Frederick Picorni. He was the most honorable man you could ever, ever know, and I please want everybody to know that. He was just such a gentle giant and such an honorable Marine, and he loved his family, and he also loved his Marines. Yeah. 
Thank God I had the Marine Corps. This week's tragedy has only added to the angst for others. Two-month-old Jocelyn Wilcox hasn't even met her father yet. Sergeant Del Wilcox deployed before she was born, and he still has no picture of her. It's kind of hard because I think about all the things that can happen and the fact that he might not come home and ever see her. I just literally sit there and hold on for dear life. Now she finds the most strength in those who have lost the most, like Shelly Picorni. I just want us all to go on and enjoy the peace that I have, and I want to be able to share that in my husband's name and in his honor. This community is now without 17,000 Marines deployed overseas, and the military families stationed here are also far away from their homes, leaving them with no one to hold on to but each other. Bobby Harley, CBS News, Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. And that's part of our world tonight. I'll be back with updates on the war throughout basketball coverage this evening. For now, Dan Rather reporting for the CBS Evening News. See you as we go. For news 24 hours a day, log on to cbsnews.com. This is CBS.